This is Access Reality. I'm Ali Kadili. We have Dr. Julie Kragenau with us today, who is an associate teaching professor at Penn State University. She's authored yeah. multiple books, including um, ABCs of Space and um, Astrophysics for Babies, which is my favorite title, uh, as well as A Student's Guide to the Mathematics of Astronomy. Uh, thank you for being with us, Dr. Julia Kragenau. Thanks for inviting me. All right, perfect. Yeah, so that title is really amazing, Astrophysics for Babies. Because um, it gives me, a, I think that's what we'll call the episode, because it gives me a carte blanche to kind of ask anything, because the point of view of a baby learning astronomy or astrophysics is no dumb questions. All right, so um, how, uh, this is something people ask, and I know it's been answered, but how, how can something uh, propel in space when there's no air, no atmosphere to push against or to burn fuel? In fact, having no air or atmosphere to push against in a way is beneficial because there's no drag or resistance. So to achieve propulsion in space, there just needs to be pushing against something inside the spacecraft. So if there is some kind of combustion or explosion inside an engine, if it's pushing against the front of the spacecraft and not against the back, then you'll get forward propulsion. So you don't actually need something to push back against. Is the fuel different that you need in the atmosphere versus in space? It's an interesting question. In the atmosphere, you can use the surrounding air as part of the combustion process. But if you don't have surrounding atmosphere, then you just need to be able to use the fuel itself to achieve some kind of explosion. Yeah, I ask that because I know the fuel that's used in airplanes uses the oxygen in the atmosphere to burn the fuel. Um, whereas, of course, that's not available in space. So you'd have to carry your own oxygen or use something totally different. Right. I'm not an expert in space fuel um, and achieving propulsion, but I would suspect that it's a completely different process that they don't use that kind of combustion as such. Um, when they're making small maneuvers to spacecraft to change the pointing or to have a little boost, then they can just use puffs of air coming out of little jets um, and not combusting anything. And when they're using other means of energy, such as solar panels or battery power, which those can be used in conjunction, then again, they don't need any kind of combustion either. All right. Um... Most of the, I will just add, most of the energy use is probably during the initial acceleration and then the spacecraft still is in the atmosphere and so probably could use a more traditional kind of combustion, having the ambient oxygen as part of the electric, um, sorry, the chemical reaction. Uh, so far, the only propulsion systems we have are chemical based, is that right? We haven't used nuclear or anything else? Don't know. Okay. And okay, something that uh, might be more germane to your expertise is um, the, um, why is the speed of light constant? Do we know that? The speed of light is constant because the way the electric and magnetic fields have to interact with each other in order to self-propagate the electromagnetic wave they regenerate one another based on the oscillation speed of the electromagnetic wave. And that is described mathematically by Maxwell's equations, which use the speed of light as one of the mathematical constants. Um, as for physically, the underlying reason why that is the case it's just how electric and magnetic waves behave in a vacuum. And so the presence of an atmosphere or not, so an ambient medium or empty space, doesn't affect how the underlying electric and magnetic waves behave. The same thing actually happens with 
gravity. We think that gravitational force is transmitted at the same speed regardless of an ambient medium or not. And it, information just can't be transmitted instantaneously or infinitely fast, but there's some kind of lag time for information to traverse distance either with electromagnetic waves in the case of light or gravitational waves in the case of gravity. Is this um, because um, photons or light has no mass and it's all energy? The minute it acquires mass, then the speed will change? That's correct, that photons have no mass. It's all energy. And if they had mass, it would be different. Um, I'm just being finicky about the wording of if it acquires mass, I would say if it had mass, then it would behave differently. Okay. But likewise, um, are, are photons the only thing we know of that is pure energy that doesn't have mass? I mean, there's a, obviously the electromagnetic spectrum, all other types of energy. Why do not all, they all move at the same speed of light? Like what's special about light per se? Hmm. Photons have no mass and all of the other subatomic particles that I know about even neutrinos have mass, a little tiny bit of mass, electrons, protons, of course, the heavier ones. Um, and so everything with mass travels slower. Um, as to why they have no mass, I'm trying to get back to your original question. It, it spurred me along thinking about the little bits of it that I do know and trying to piece them together. So was your question, are there any other forms of energy that have no mass or does everything have mass? Anything else? Uh, well, that's part of it is, um, are there other forms of energy that have no mass? But the other thing is, does anything that has no mass, will that move at also at the speed of light? Or is there some unique property to photons? Good question. I don't know for sure. I would use the example of gravitational waves. The gravitational waves themselves don't have mass, although gravity is a phenomenon that happens because of mass, but the waves themselves don't carry mass with them and they, we think, move at the speed of light as well. So perhaps it is that forms of energy without mass, such as electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves, um, both move at the speed of light. So maybe if there were others, they would do the same yeah, and we don't know anything else that can move that fast okay and why can nothing move faster than the speed of light yeah the cosmic speed limit right it and the the wording that i like to say is that information cannot be transmitted faster than the speed of light just a couple weeks ago i was teaching my astronomy class about the expansion of the universe and one of the properties we discuss, Hubble's law, is that velocity is proportional to distance in the expanding universe. So when you look at things, galaxies, that are sufficiently far away, their distance is proportional to how fast they appear to be moving away from you because they're being swept along with expanding space. And there is no speed limit to that. The perceived speed or the relative speed between an observer and a distant galaxy because space is expanding between you can exceed the speed of light. If it does, you cannot actually perceive the thing that is moving away from you faster than that because its light can't get to you. However, those galaxies that are receding away from us or would be if we could see them faster than the speed of light aren't breaking the cosmic speed limit because they're not traveling through space at a speed faster than light. It is a cumulative perceived expansion, uh, a recession based on all the little bits of space between us and them all added up who would exceed the speed of light. So depending on how finicky you wanna be about the language, you could say, well, the universe can expand faster than light, but that's taken cumulatively over very large scales and the information can't get from one side to the other and break that speed limit. But yeah. what the consequence is, and this is pretty profound, I think, that it means there's a region around us in the universe, our observable universe, 
there's not an ad edge to it, not an edge to the whole universe and not an edge to our observable portion of it, but there's a perceived horizon past which we cannot see because the stuff out there, it's cumulative expansion of the whole universe, everything between us and them would take it away from us faster than the speed of light. So we can't see it. And if there's anyone out there, <laughs> They can't see us because we're just too far away. We're causally disconnected. So maybe the universe as a whole, you could say, is expanding faster than light, but we can't cheat and get the information across the vastness. Yeah, so would you say that's just a function of because we depend on photons and light to perceive something? Um, yes. And that's why we can't see them. Otherwise, objectively, if we had a different way of seeing them, you know, then, then we could. Yes. It's a great way to say it. All right. And um, you mentioned the galaxies moving away from each other. Um, they are moving. So it's not like they're moving, but we're also moving. So the distance between us is the same, uh, the relative distance. It's that they are moving away. We're moving away from them. Everything is moving away from everything else. Is yes. That, is that the case? Yeah. Everything's moving away from everything else. And it's not that any of us is moving through space. There might be things that would cause us to move through space for different reasons, like gravitational attraction of near neighbor galaxies. But the perceived recession, the movement away, is because of the expansion of the of space itself, of the universe. And so all galaxies would see, now again, we're imagining beings there to perceive this would see all other galaxies moving away due to the expansion and they're all along for the ride seeming to sit still in their own little local region of space but getting swept along as the space over there expands away from the space here we're both kind of going along with the space surrounding us what is the role of dark energy and dark matter in the expansion of space Dark matter and dark energy kind of have opposite effects. They sound and are often lumped together as similar ideas because they both have the word dark in them, but dark matter has mass and therefore obeys gravity. Dark energy does not. Dark matter being subject to, or you could say causing gravity pulls because gravity is an attractive force. Dark energy, on the other hand, seems to have the opposite effect. And it seems to have a kind of repulsion, almost like a pressure. It, these words are not used quantitatively and specifically, but oh, it acts like anti-gravity. And I'm saying that very colloquially. Um, so dark energy seems to be speeding up the expansion of the universe, whereas dark matter and its associated gravity, if anything, would do the opposite and would slow it down. And we don't think that there's enough dark energy to appreciably slow the expansion of the universe. So we think the dark energy is winning, gravity's losing, and the expansion appears to be speeding up with time. Uh, you meant dark matter doesn't have enough um, kind of power to keep it from expanding? Dark matter and its associated gravity does pull and so if anything, it would counteract the expansion of the universe, but we think there's not enough dark matter and not enough associated energy with it okay. to slow and certainly ever stop the expansion. Even though there's more dark matter than regular matter, there's still not enough dark matter to stop the expansion or even slow it down because there's dark energy that wins has a overall on the large scales higher enough energy density that the dark energy and its associated repulsion is winning. And you can deduce the presence of dark matter from the gravitational effects so of the shadows that we see from that. Um, exactly. We deduce that the dark matter is there because of its gravitational effects. I wouldn't say shadows because a shadow suggests that it blocks light or that it's seen in silhouette or something, which is not the case for dark matter. It is the case for some things we can see in space, like dark clouds of gas and dust, but not the dark matter. The dark matter doesn't seem to interact with light at all in any kind of a blocking way. One thing that matter can do, including dark matter, is it can warp 
light through gravitational lensing where light beams passing through a region of space, if there's strong gravity, it can actually divert the path of light and cause a lensing or distortion effect. But that wouldn't look like a shadow, it would look like a distortion, sometimes a duplicate image or a stretched out or distorted image, like looking through a lens. But uh, through the um, gravitational effects, we're deducing the presence of the dark matter and we're quantifying it. Um, but how about dark energy? How are we deducing the presence of dark energy? Dark energy has been trickier to observe or observationally deduce. And the dark matter is hard enough already to see because we can't see it directly. So both of these have to be perceived indirectly. The dark matter, as you said, through its gravitational effects on other things around it or holding galaxies together like glue or warping the light passing by it. Now with dark energy, the only way we've deduced that it's there is by measuring the expansion rate of the universe by looking at things very far away because of the lag time of light traveling that's like looking very far back into the past and by looking at lots of different ranges of distances of things from very far to near we can sample the universe and how it was behaving and how it was expanding at many different points in the past and construct together a timeline of how the expansion has been changing with time and that's how they figured out that the dark energy existed because they saw that the expansion has been speeding up and nothing we knew about in the universe would have caused that because gravity should pull nothing should push and speed up the expansion and so that was the original discovery and it's been repeated several times in the last couple of decades uh, it was the expansion of the accelerating universe that first gave rise to the idea of dark energy would it be uh, would it be fair to say that dark energy is um, the majority of what constitutes the energy in the universe? It's, um, it's the main fabric of the universe in terms of the energy that exists. It's the majority of what's out there. Yep. If you were to put together a budget, like sometimes you see a pie chart representing all the budget of a, a country's expenditures, the energy, the mass slash energy budget of all the energy in the universe, three quarters of it would be dark energy. Almost one quarter of it would be dark matter and the remaining little sliver, about 5% would be normal matter, baryonic matter that is made of protons and making up atoms and the normal stuff, everything that we see around us that makes up stars and the earth and even the air that we're breathing, all of that is normal matter. We're all in that little 5% sliver of the pie. Um, is it, the, we talked about the speed of light being constant and the way that it is. Is it theoretically possible to move faster than the speed of light for anything that has mass or matter? Is it theoretically possible to move faster than the speed of light? There are ways to manipulate the math to show the mathematically how you would do this with I've heard of ideas of using wormholes, bending space time to connect to very far apart regions of space through some kind of shortcut through space time um, or some kind of almost science fiction esque warp drive that would warp the space around a spacecraft in a way that you could like this for a flat space time and you could kind of warp it so that you could sort of skip over this wrinkled part and cheat and not actually have to traverse all the space in between. Mathematically, you can show how it would be possible, but we don't have the technology to do anything like that. I don't even know how we would begin to design such technology, but science fiction movies and books that want to achieve transport over large distances and not wait all of the associated lag time. Um, they use stuff like that warp drive things to, to cheat and skip all the distance. Yeah, I could see how theoretically, you know, if you bend space time to make two points meet instantaneously, but in reality, can you really do that? Because the area that you're bending, I know we're thinking in physical terms, 
but what about all the stuff in between, <laughs> like all the facts right. and like what's happening to the, and I think, uh, you know, I have to admit, I do watch Star Trek sometimes. And, oh, uh, me too. I'm a total Trekkie. I love it. Yeah, but there were a few episodes about how the repeat warp travel was fracturing the fabric of space-time itself because mm -hmm. of these effects. Because you, you keep bending a paper so much that it's eventually going to thin out and break. They must have had some theoretical physicists consult on that show or something. I wouldn't be surprised. But um, So yeah, I don't know. You, you asked, so is there any way practically in reality to do it? And I would say no. Okay, because I would think that physically just moving faster, something approaching the speed of light or faster, um, wouldn't be something that our biological bodies can even tolerate, like being pressed against something that fast. Um, so there's got to be then, then that means the universe is just impossible to explore. In any it's life. so vast, right? It would be impractical um, or it, impossible to get very far, how many Gs can the human body withstand? Right? And, and how, what's the length of a human lifetime or the operating lifetime of a human made piece of machinery? Um, yeah, that we think the universe is much vaster than we ever have any practical hope of, even with extensions of technology that exists and technology that we could imagine. Um, the universe is much more vast than our reach. Okay. Uh, according to Einstein's theory, we know that the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. Um, at what threshold does that become significant? That you're losing not just a fraction of a second, but you, you know. So presumably at the speed of light itself, there is no, you're not passing time at all. Time stands still for you. Is that correct? But al along that spectrum, at what point yeah. does it become significant? So that, oh, I just lost a few years, you know. Right. So you're asking about relativity. Yeah. And special relativity is the consideration about how time, when something is moving very fast compared to the speed of light, there seems to be time dilation or contraction effects. And special relativity refers to moving very fast. The other relativity, general relativity, is when gravity is very strong. But anyway, you asked at what point does it become measurable, noticeable, significant? Um, and anything within our realm of human experience and our technology, it's minuscule. Tiny fractions of a second that are very difficult to even measure. Um, so it would never be relevant in normal everyday life for for me and you know and for normal people but with really sensitive technology they actually can if they try really hard measure the effects uh, one that physics students always learn about is there's this very short-lived particle that uh, is created when high energy uh, cosmic rays or solar wind or something interacts high in the atmosphere and it's created and and rains down on earth but it should only live such a brief fraction of a second it shouldn't make it down very far before the particle just dissociates or decays i can't remember the details um, but because the particle moves very fast it actually ends up from its perspective seeming to live longer enough that it actually makes it down through most of the atmosphere instead of only making it part way and that's because of relativistic effects so the fact that we can even measure those particles I think it's muons or something like that. The fact that we can even measure them um, at the bottom of our atmosphere means that relativity must be true, must be happening. No, oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Do you, could we develop um, any technology that moves close to the speed of light or at the speed of light, do you think? In a practical sense? In a practical sense, that's a little bit subjective, <laughs> that term, but I think we'd be limited by, like you mentioned before, what the human body could withstand. 
like how many G's of acceleration. So for any kind of a spacecraft that we might build, if we maxed out what the human body could experience with acceleration, it would take so many years to get up to appreciable speeds that where relativity would really matter and you, we could even measure a time difference um, that we haven't practically had the opportunity to carry out that experiment, let alone the fuel requirements and the federal budget that would be required to build that experiment. Um, but I might think we could, it would just be very expensive time-wise, fuel-wise and energy-wise. Um, so yeah, yeah, we could. We're just spending our money on other things right now. Um, we have, with existing technology, measured tiny time differences, not enough like in years that you would notice it with the difference of a human body aging or anything, but down to fractions of a second, we have been able to measure relativistic effects and corrections, um, things like really precise clocks. If we send one up on a fast spacecraft, or not even a spacecraft, I imagine if we sent up a clock on a really fast jet airplane and flew it around for a couple hours, couple days, um, a tiny fraction of a second difference in time passage would be measurable with our really precise clocks. Okay, I'm back to the um, uh, the speed of light and anything being able to move faster than the speed of light. Um, there are theoretical particles called tachyons that move faster than the speed of light. Um, is that um, th does that go against the idea that nothing can move faster than the speed of light? I have to confess my ignorance here. I don't know about tachyons. I only remember hearing about them in Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, in Star Trek, I think in Star Trek, they talk about them in terms of time travel. Okay. Somehow that when you move faster than the speed of light, then something happens with time. Um, that just for my vague, we're assuming a lot. We're assuming that uh, Star Trek is very accurate, but. And I have been terrible about keeping up with modern physics and what they're learning in particle physics. It's, uh, it's just it, uh, not something I've done a good job keeping up with. Apologies. Uh, another thing is um, when you're in space, um, I, don't, I think it's very disorienting for us to think of it this way, but there, it's not just you're not on a road on a level field and there's right and left and you know, um, you're talking up, down, any direction, right? Um, so navigation there will be quite a bit different. Um, and are the things in space all over the place? Like, you know, we always, you know, see in photos of the sun and the planets around it in one plane. Uh, is that the case or are some higher, lower than others? How, how, how are they actually uh, occupying space in space? That's a really good point about directionality in space, left and right and up and down, or does up and down have meaning? Um, I mean, I guess if you're close to the surface of the earth, down is toward the earth and up is away from the earth. But back to your bigger question about the orientation of the planets and the sun in the plane of the solar system. Actually, yes, all the planets and most of their moons are roughly within 10 degrees or so in the same plane. And that's not an accident. We think that's a byproduct of how the solar system formed from a collapsing cloud of gas and dust that had some amount of spin and it tended to preferentially collapse along a plane that was perpendicular to the spin axis. And so, yeah, all the planets now orbit in that plane. The moons that formed from gravitational collapse also orbit in the same plane and they all orbit in the same direction. There are very few exceptions to that. And each of those exceptions we think was probably because of some collision that knocked something off its axis or sent something careening off this way or from a gravitational capture of something that came in from another direction and got gravitationally captured and then it would be spinning or orbiting the wrong direction. So yeah, our solar system is roughly all in the, the bodies in the same plane. That includes the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt. Um, the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy 
also most of the material, at least the visible material, not the dark matter, is confined to roughly the same plane as well, though it's not coincident with the plane of our solar system. All the different stars in our galaxy, and probably many of them have their own planets and planetary systems, those are all seem to be at different arbitrary random angles compared to our sun, because each of those stars or groups of stars had some kind of randomness about the spin that its little clump of gas and dust had when it started to collapse. And so on the large scale of our galaxy, the spin axes and the perpendicular corresponding planes of any planetary systems are all randomized relative to one another. Yeah, other than the, um, the way things were formed, beyond that, is there um, something about the size, shape, mass of, let's say, the sun or any planet, in addition to its gravity, that pulls things and makes it in a certain plane? Uh, so, for example, if the sun were to acquire a capture or another planet or an ast a big asteroid or something, would, it would likely still be in the same plane. If the sun captured another body, like an asteroid passing by, an interloper from another solar system that came in, there's nothing that would pull it into the same plane that the planets and our moons already occupy. It would depend almost entirely on the traje trajectory that that thing came in on. It would just maintain that plane. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I guess, is this kind of an indirect proof that all the planets and asteroids that currently exist in the solar system are native to this solar system? Yes. And not, not, not a captured rogue planet or something like that? That's right. All right, great. Um, and um, in terms of stars, we have these nomenclatures for them, according to their energy signature, but we call them you know, things like white dwarfs, red giants. Um, are they actually those colors? A little bit. So a red giant star, if you look at the spectrum of its colors, it is red-ish white because it's got preferentially a little bit more red than it does blue and purple on the long wavelength side of the visible window. Uh, is red and on the short wavelength side is, is blue and green and purple. So yeah, a red giant, let me, let me back up. So for a star that looks white, like our sun, um, the visible part of the spectrum, if you imagine that being kind of a hill shape here centered on, on my face, um, it's peaked in the middle of the visible spectrum and that looks white. A red giant spectrum will be peaked more on the red side, maybe even over into the infrared side, but our eyes would perceive that as red-ish white because it still has all the visible colors here, but more red than blue. A uh, blue giant star or a blue colored star would, would be kind of tilted the other way, more blue than red, but still all the colors present in the visible region. So it would still look whitish but a little bit more bluish white than reddish white. So white dwarf, its spectrum tends to peak in the more toward the blue side. So it might look a little bit bluish. Um, a red giant or a red dwarf, those are a couple thousand degrees cooler. So they tend to peak on the red side. Okay. And, um... So our sun is, if you're looking at it from outer space, is white, not yellow. We white. see it as yellow because it's through our atmosphere. Are there any yellow stars? Yep. A star that's intermediate in color and, and there, uh, the underlying property that dictates color is temperature. There, a star that's intermediate in color between our sun, a white star, and a red star would look yellow. Absolutely. Okay. And just one more thing back to, um, you know, the propulsion systems and things like that. Um, would antimatter propulsion, like using positrons or something else, um, is that something that can be used? As a practical matter, I don't know of any way that we've practically harnessed that. It's so energetically expensive to 
accelerate things up to the necessary speeds in particle accelerators to even create these particles, tiny number of you know, positrons and the corresponding electrons, and then add it on to that energy expense, which goes along with it, the dollar expense, to then try to capture those and isolate them from their opposite particles so that they don't immediately annihilate. I don't even know practically how we would capture those for any length of time and even transport them somewhere and then keep them shielded so that they would um, be ready when we want to use them. Yeah, I, I just don't know of any technology that could do that. Okay. And um, again, according to Einstein's relativity, um, we look at gravity now as being like a, a well in the fabric of space-time in which an object rotates. Um, so how does an object's orbit deteriorate then over time? What makes it deteriorate? Like for example, I heard Mars's moons, their orbits are deteriorating. Ultimately they'll crash into Mars. And our moon's orbit is kind of deteriorating in a different way. It's moving further away from Earth. Um, what, what, what brings that on? Is it collision with other asteroids? Is it, did they vent or lose energy from their inner core or what? When an object's orbit changes, it's because energy is going somewhere. Energy always has to be conserved, but it can be changed between one form and another. So sometimes an orbit will decay or deteriorate if you think of a spacecraft in orbit around Earth, because it's just a, a little bit above the atmosphere and there's no sharp edge to the atmosphere. So there might be a little bit of drag that could slow an orbit down and something could eventually spiral in. Moons of planets tend to be so far outside the atmosphere that it's not drag from the atmosphere that slows them down, but it, they could lose energy due to uh, gravitational deformation of the moon. Jupiter's moons experience this a lot. They are squeezed and stretched by the tidal forces from Jupiter's gravity. And in this case, when they lose energy due to that friction, it heats up the interior of the moon from actually squishing and stretching the rocks. It doesn't cause their orbit to decay, but it can cause the moons to heat up and be molten inside. In the case of Io, a very volcanically active body, it can also cause a moon to lose rotational energy. So it spins in place slower and slower and we think our moon did that and now it's tidally locked to earth it used to orbit excuse me it used to spin faster and its spin got slowed down um so the energy has to go somewhere um let's see what else would cause an orbit to decay i wasn't aware that mars's moons were orbitally decaying, I would guess that they're far enough outside of the atmosphere that they're not losing energy from drag. Was there another example that you wanted to fold in? Remind me. Um, no, just, um, uh, um, you know, in general, we think of these like moons as being very stable uh -huh. around planets, but in reality, maybe all of them are not, or most of them are not, let's say. Our moon certainly does undergo very slow changes. And by the way, it's not just conservation of energy that we have to consider, it's conservation of angular momentum, so spin energy. And so in fact, the reason that our moon, as you said, it's doing the opposite thing, it's actually gradually spiraling outward, drifting away from Earth. That's due to conservation of angular momentum because the Earth and the Moon, inter, um, the interplay between those two, it's a system. The Earth's spin is gradually slowing down because it's losing energy from friction, from tides and deforming, um, squishing and stretching largely of the water sloshing around due to the tidal forces from the Moon. Um, so the Earth is slowing down in, in its spin. So that's causing it to lose angular momentum and then the moon makes up for that and gains angular momentum by moving farther away from earth will earth eventually stop rotating then earth will eventually slow its rotation to the point where it's tidally locked or we and the moon are tidally locked and then we'll spin at the same rate that the moon is going around so the moon won't appear to move across our sky anymore 
it'll appear to stay fixed in our sky and we'll only see it from one half of the Earth. And at that point, Earth's spin will stop slowing, the tides will stop sloshing, and the moon will stop moving farther away. Any other consequences of the Earth, you know, stop halting its movement? Well, so it's not going to stop its movement. It's going to stop the slowing of its movement, and it'll reach some minimum energy state where it's not going to slow anymore. Um, I, the length of day by then, I, I forget. I probably calculated it at one point, but it'll be, see the Earth, the day is currently 24 hours. It'll be, I don't know, 40, 50, 100 hours, something like that, several times longer. Um, so it's not going to be like we're, we don't experience day and night anymore. The Earth still will spin on its axis. Day will just be longer. All right, and um, do you, is the moon too big to be a moon for our Earth? Well, like when you look at, because like Jupiter's moons are almost the same size as our moon, and look at the difference in size between Jupiter and the Earth. Yeah, uh, Earth's moon is definitely on the big side compared to the other moons in our solar system, and compared to the size of its planet, we're almost kind of like a double, double planet system. We, we have got a big moon. Yeah, and um, yeah, and uh, you know the issue of being tidally locked. Um, I guess other moons in our solar system also have that. Yep, there are some moons that are tidally locked to their planets, and so on. And in fact, the planet Mercury is tidally locked uh, to the sun. Its spin has slowed down to the point where it, um, the same side of Mercury, always faces the sun. So that has a huge consequence in the the day side of Mercury is baked to a crisp, and the night side of Mercury is actually really cold. So it just never sees the sun. Hmm. All right. To, to go back to your question about the moon and our moon being kind of big, the definition of what's a moon versus a planet is not based on size. As you probably know, it's based on what something is orbiting. And so uh, it is possible for a moon to be bigger than a planet, not the planet it orbits probably, but for example, Jupiter's moon Ganymede, it's the largest moon in the solar system. It's larger than the planet, well, dwarf planet, Pluto. But Pluto is just called a dwarf planet because it orbits the sun, and Ganymede is just called a moon because it orbits Jupiter, a planet. Yeah, like if Earth or Venus were rotating around Jupiter, they would be called moons too. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, I'm going to go into like a little segment where... Um, that lots of rumors in astronomy kind of circulate and I don't know if you, if you know this in um, like lots of memes on Instagram will say, oh, did you know this and that? And some of these things are true and some of them are not true. And so I just wanted to run some of them by you. And one of them that I kept seeing lately was that uh, it says Jupiter doesn't actually rotate around the sun. It says the sun, and, Ju it says the sun and Jupiter rotate around another fixed point or something. Oh, okay. So I haven't heard this one about Jupiter specifically, um, but technically it's true that any planet and its star, so any of the planets in our solar system and our sun, technically they orbit one another and they orbit more precisely, you could say their common center of mass. So Jupiter being the biggest planet in our solar system, it's probably easiest to envision it with Jupiter. So if we've got our sun, big fat star, Jupiter, it's 10 times smaller in diameter, a thousand times smaller in volume. Um, it's not just that the sun stays fixed and Jupiter orbits around it, but rather the sun wobbles in response to Jupiter's gravity because they gravitationally tug on one another. So the sun's little wobble here, it's an orbit mathematically in every way. It obeys the behavior of an orbit just like Jupiter. It's just a very small orbit. Um, so yeah, the sun and Jupiter orbit one another's common center of mass. The common center of mass in that case is so much closer to the sun that it's actually inside the volume of the sun. So the sun just kind of wobbles in place. So that's what the sun is doing in response to Jupiter's gravity, the sun is doing the same thing in response to the gravity of each of the other planets. It's executing a separate little wobble. And so if you superimpose all of those different wobbles on top of one another, the sun is actually doing a really complicated jiggling around um, from all the planets. And it just kind of looks chaotic if you add all those wobbles on top of one another. But 
yeah, that's true. Um, but I will also say that it's such a subtle effect that it's only been observed relatively recently because we had the technology to notice it. Mm, okay. And speaking of rumors also, um, the fact that the solar system has two suns, not just one. Um, and then some have theorized it might be a black hole. I think there was an article in Times that called, called it was entitled uh, The Sun's Dark Sister or something. But can you tell us more about that? Are there any gravitational effects or any other phenomena that lead us to believe there is another sun in the solar system or has that been completely debunked? I have to go with completely debunked on that one. Great, and I, I think it might, have, it might have, theory, you know, it's just so much more fun to write about something surprising and shock people. Oh, sorry, if I can go back to the previous topic for a sec. We said that our sun is wobbling in response to the gravity of all of the planets in our solar system. Other stars are doing that because of planets orbiting them. And that's actually how we discover planets orbiting other stars in many cases is by noticing that very subtle wobble. Oh, okay. And then hopefully corroborate it with like a dimming of the light around the sun or... Yep. If, the, if we get a chance alignment and we're lucky that if the planet passes in front of its star, then there would be a corresponding dimming. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that sun question may have been hypothesized based on um, the fact that most solar systems are double suns. Binary stars are very common. Our sun is a little bit unusual in being completely solitary. Maybe our sun was formed as part of a system with other stars, a binary or a trinary or some larger system, um, and then that maybe dissipated and now our sun is solo. But our sun is in the minority of stars in its solo status. But perhaps that shouldn't be a surprise because a multiple star system would be a complicated gravitational place and maybe hard for a planet to maintain a stable orbit and thus have stable conditions suitable for the development of life. Okay, so I, I initially thought you were gonna answer this by saying just because we're special, uh, but the way you explained it, it does lead to the same kind of conclusion for life to arise. Yeah. And, and may, so yeah, maybe we are special and that's why we're here because <laughs> We just got lucky enough to have a stable system. Okay. Another rumor, uh, planet number nine. I'm not talking about Pluto, uh, but the speculation that there's another planet with some sort of um, orbit that's very elliptical and wide, so we don't see it every you know years and years. Um, is there any evidence for that? I haven't heard of any evidence for that. Okay, because uh, I thought there was some unaccounted for gravitational effects that they said could be then due to this. And then some were saying it's just a larger object in the Kuiper belt, and some were saying, no, it's, it is a ninth planet, but only appears every s hundreds of years or so. I haven't seen anything compelling about that yet. Okay. All right. Um, and um, rogue planets, do they, um, do they actually exist? They can. I don't know that we've seen any come by, but there's no reason why they couldn't. Space is big and mostly empty. So the chances aren't great that one's gonna come visit. But remember how I said that stars can form in multiple system binaries and trinaries, and then maybe our sun did, and then maybe that system dissipated well that means that the objects drifted away from one another they didn't cease to exist but they could achieve gravitational uh, escape escape velocity and then not be orbiting one another anymore the same thing could happen with planets orbiting stars if some kind of gravitational interaction maybe two planets in a system slingshotted past one another some had a close interaction one of them could certainly or both get ejected from the system and it would go somewhere. Space is so big and empty, it probably would never interact with anything or not for any reasonable time, but it could. It could um, either get gravitationally captured into another system or maybe just do a near flyby and get diverted off in some other direction. And so for a short period of time, it could be uh, visiting rogue 
planet. Yeah, that absolutely could happen. It could happen to planets and it could happen to stars. We even think that stars can get gravitationally ejected from their galaxies and actually go sailing through the almost completely empty velvety inky blackness of intergalactic space. Call them not runaway stars. Okay. Um, now, uh, the planet Vulcan in Star Trek apparently it was based on a real kind of hypothesized planet that's, that was supposed to be close to the sun. Um, can you tell us some of the history behind that? I'm sorry, I don't know the history about this story. I just, um, it, it does, we don't think it exists for in real life. Maybe they used to speculate about it. And I can't say any more about the, what I'm sure is an interesting history. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, something, to look, something I need to look up to a little bit on. Um, but I guess it was um, something that was looked at and then um, again, no proof was found for it. And now there's just mercury, which is... Yeah, and I think if, I bet it will have been many decades now, maybe over a century that we must have concluded that it didn't exist because if it did, we would have found it. And it's, if it were as close as or comparably close to our sun as Mercury, we certainly would have found it by now and would have seen its gravitational interactions or some might speculate, well, what if it were exactly on the opposite side from Earth? And so it's always behind the sun and we would never see it. Well, we have sent spacecraft out uh, to visit the other planets and they would have seen it by now. Or, and even if we had been stuck on Earth, we would have seen some kind of gravitational influence from it. So we can, even though I don't know the specifics of the history of the speculation about Vulcan, I don't hesitate to say that we can, uh, I'm sure have ruled it out. Okay. Um, can you um, explain what the Van, Van Allen radiation belt is? Is that just the magnetosphere around the Earth? That beyond that is the radiation is higher, or is that all that is? I don't remember the details. The, uh, the reason yeah. I cite it is it's uh, given as a reason for some people why humans can never really go out into outer space. Um, so I, I think it's related to radiation. So. And I had thought so I assumed it would be a challenge, but something that with technology, with the appropriate shielding and precautions that we could protect ourselves from the higher radiation doses in space. Um, yeah, and it's, I'm losing the details about it now from when I, I suppose I must have learned about this. Um, there's the Van Allen radiation belts, but then there's also this region surrounding the sun, the magnetosphere or the magnetopause or something. And um, I think the Voyager spacecraft a couple of years ago finally made it outside this region of influence around our sun where the, now the radiation is higher. Um, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give up on human space travel for that reason yet. Okay. We have bigger challenges. That's good to know. Um, now, um, back to astrophysics for babies. I'm going to ask a baby question. Um, is the sun hot? Um, or is it, is space just freezing cold despite the sun and any star being there, no matter how close it is? And the, the heat comes from just the reflection off of surfaces rather than the sun itself producing heat per se. It produces energy, but not heat. Is that true? Uh, interesting point. Um, yeah, the way the word heat is used in physics, some people get really passionate about this and, and say that we're all using the word wrong. Heat is sometimes defined as the transfer of energy from one body to another. Two things are in thermal contact and energy flows, that's heat. Um, but when you originally asked, is the sun hot? My gut reaction was, <laughs> Well, it depends on your scale. <laughs> depends how your scale is calibrated. As stars go, the sun's average. And so there are plenty of stars that are a lot hotter and some that are cooler. But I mean, certainly by human experience, um, the thousands of degrees 
or if you want to think in the Kelvin scale, the thousands of Kelvins that the sun is, is certainly hotter than anything I encounter in, in my lifetime here on Earth. Um, and so yet stars are hot, they're thousands of degrees, you know, 10 times, 20 times hotter than your oven. But space is cold. You also mentioned that, that's very true. The average temperature of space, if you think about on the large scales, the energy density of say the, the ambient energy left over from the formation of the universe, the cosmic background radiation, on average, how far that, or how much that energy has dissipated um, the average temperature of space is only like three kelvins so that's on the kelvin scale zero is absolute zero so yeah on average space is really cold but when you're near a star as planets are we're kept warm by being close to our star and having the light from that star bathing the surface of our planet and warming us up. Um, so yeah, the sun is hot and the closer you get to it, the more concentrated the energy pouring off of it is, um, or that you could talk about the energy density or energy flux. So the closer you are, the more concentrated. Um, so at its surface, the sun is thousands of Kelvins at the distance of the earth, one astronomical unit away. It keeps us at a nice toasty, I don't know what the average would be if you neglected other sources of energy or trapping of the sun's energy. I don't know, a couple hundred Kelvins. I just asked that because on a hot, sunny day, it could be hot on the surface, but if you move up in the sky towards the sun, it becomes freezing cold. Um, despite the fact that you're moving closer, quote unquote, to the sun. Um, and that kind of you know, it was just making me think, is it then the, the fact that the sun is reflecting off of the surfaces as causing the heat rather than the sun energy itself? Yes, and also the fact that the farther and closer to the surface of the earth you are, the thicker the air is, and you're also getting heat radiating up, like you said, reflecting off the surfaces of heat radiating from the warm surface of our planet. So yeah, as you get higher above the surface of the yeah. planet, the air thins out, you're not as warmed by the surface, not being as close beneath you. So, so the atmosphere yeah. is trapping the heat also. Yeah. Yes. So if you were up in, an astronaut were out in space and they um, took off their, or like opened up their space helmet, their skin would freeze to death, even though they're technically slightly a few tens of miles closer to the sun without an atmosphere around them trapping the heat. Um, yeah, it is freezing cold in space still, All despite right. the sunlight. They would be getting sunburn from the ultraviolet from the sun while their skin is freezing. Okay, so they're being radiated to death and frozen to death. At and the same frozen, time. yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, on that very positive note, we'll end. Thank you very much, Dr. Kraganov, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me in. Thanks. Sorry again for keeping you waiting an hour.